Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining me for another episode of the SCP podcast. My name is Patty Weider, and I'm excited to have um, one of our members join us here today, Dan Radecki. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you for being here with me today. I'm excited to have a chat and learn a little bit more about you. Thanks. 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 Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be able to do this because I've been working with the group for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's great to to be able to have some discussions like this and and see what people are up to and uh, what's meaningful to pursue in this field. Yeah, yeah. So before we start digging into your professional interests, tell me a little bit about your life outside of work and what kind of things are um, you know uh, bringing you joy outside of work. Outside of work, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's a novelty. Um, yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, uh, as a neuroscientist by training, I guess I'm a slave to what I've studied over the past 30 years. So I really focus on building resilience and managing stress. So mm -hmm. uh, incorporating that into my life, it's about being outdoors, uh, being around family, uh, doing, uh, I used to love doing triathlons. Now I'm here in California, it's very easy to do. Beach volleyball, swimming, all that type of thing that, you know, the, the again, I think, <laughs> I think I'm, uh, it's a it's a occupational hazard being a, a neuroscientist and knowing what's good for your brain uh -huh. and and trying to incorporate that. So that's sort of has shaped my life and, and well, so it really good. is about that. Yeah, yeah you're and, able and, to practice what you preach. I think that's a good thing that um, you know your training has influenced you uh, to yeah. be able to do the things you love and enjoy, but also keep your body moving. And uh, my training was in health psychology, and and I love that um, you know integration of the mind and body and and how are we supporting all of our well-being um so i'm glad that you're able to have that great weather in california and get out uh, <laughs> not to rub it in patty so yeah <laughs> that's okay he, he let me know he's uh, from ohio so i know that you've experienced <laughs> some of the trials of the you know midwest weather so um, tell me a little bit more. You know, you mentioned that your training was in neuropsychology. Where has that kind of taken you in your career path and, and into your kind of specialty area of con, uh, consulting? Yeah, yeah. It, um, I really focused in the academics early on, um, had, had done my PhD in neuroscience, an MA in psychology, and uh, started a postdoc at Yale and realized I really wanted to get into the clinical aspect of it to help people. Um, the basic research is great, but I really wanted to get into the practical applications. So I started in the industry, in biotech industry at Pfizer, and then I moved over a few years later to a company called Allergan, where we really focused on research in psychiatry, uh, pain, and that's about the time I started the um, Academy of Brain-Based Leadership to really work with consultants, with coaches, to help them understand the neuroscience behind uh, behavioral change and and why mm -hmm. coaching can work and how to drive people motivation by understanding what their brain needs that type of thing. So okay. it's been really rewarding because I think it's even expanded. I found to not just the coaching realm and working with people in the industry, you know, I/O, but we branched out to kids, teenagers, mm -hmm. um, parents. You're a coach if you're a parent, right? Yeah. And uh, and so it's been really rewarding to see that aspect of it. So to really work on that mental health aspect of that. Yeah. OK. So you've kind of been in some different, um, I would say, you know, sections of the industry, more in the academic piece, the clinical piece. What led you into uh, more of the consulting interest? Like what was it that kind of caused you to branch out from where you were? I think it was working in the industry as a leader in a big company, but also understanding the science, the neuroscience, the psychology behind what leadership and behavior is about and there was a big disconnect and just because mm -hmm. you uh, were technically savvy and great in your field and became a leader it didn't mean you were a good leader i mean you were good technically mm -hmm. um so wanting to bridge those and wanting to help people to bridge that so i saw a need there still none as you know mm -hmm. that's what scp is about um yeah. an unmet need right mm -hmm. and, and to be able to bridge that gap and there's still a huge unmet need in our world as we see. So that's really what got me interested. 
Yeah, yeah. So being able to be within organizations and see, oh, maybe I could bring some of this yeah. science to help. Yeah. You know, and feeling the pain, people. right? As a leader in that organization, in the organization, we're feeling the pain. And as a neuroscientist saying, why aren't we doing this the right mm -hmm. way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looking around and wondering like, oh, maybe I, you know, I could help with this. <laughs> it seems like maybe they don't know the things that I you know, um, know that could could maybe influence the way we're doing things and maybe do them a little bit more effectively. Yeah, and, and I, I remember having discussions with Ken Nowak about this and, and saying, because we, we did guest uh, uh, editorial um, for one of the uh, special journals a few years ago mm -hmm. and um, talking about how we really, in our field, one of the pitfalls we have as neuroscientists is overestimating what leaders know mm -hmm. and what they're, mm -hmm what their capacities are. And, and I really found that to be the case even in the C-suite. So, Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So sometimes we start to feel like, oh, well, this is common sense, but, but maybe yes. it's not. Maybe some of these things that we've learned through our graduate training and our careers really are things that we're bringing to people that are new ideas and yes. fresh ways of looking at some of the things that maybe they thought they knew um, that, you know, aren't really working for them. So, um, so you mentioned, you know, working with Ken on a um, journal and I'm wondering sort of what got you involved with SCP? How did you, you know, uh, connect and, and, you know, what's that been like for you? Oh, it's been great. I mean, we, we had a, uh, there was an annual meeting, I think in 2017 in Florida, and I did a, a talk there on psychological safety and some of the ways that we at Academy of Brain-Based Leadership that we uh, help teach people how to manage psychological safety and build brain resilience. And from that, Ken um, really wanted to do, in his mind, he had a special uh, journal article that he wanted to put together. It was the Neuroscience of Consulting Psychology back in 2018. And he really wanted to, to talk about and educate um, you know, your followers and, and the, the, the people within the groups who follow Society of Consulting Psychology and the practitioners about the neuroscience. And, you know, it really isn't something that's that's fluff and marketing. There, there's yeah. some real pieces to this. So they, after that, he got um, on board uh, Richard Boyatzis, uh, Anthony Jack, Elliot Berkman. Paul Zak wrote an article on high trust in organizations. Bob Eichinger did, um, you know, sort of uh, an ob objective piece on should we get aboard this brain train? That was the title of the article. Mm -hmm. And uh, myself and, and um, Golnaz Tabidnia wrote uh, our article about brain resilience. So we really attacked it from that neuroscience aspect. And I mm -hmm. think people really enjoyed that because it gave them the ability to think about it from a biological standpoint. And in our experience, when you talk about, here's your brain, here's how your brain is reacting, here's how your brain's behaving, you allow people to take a step back and be objective about their behavior and their biases, and it makes it easier. So I think that was, it was really fascinating to do that, to see how people responded to it. Yeah. So maybe detaching some of the shame that might come along exactly. with our exactly. maybe not so beneficial strategies we've been using, but maybe there are some reasons why our brain defaults to yes. some of those strategies. And like I said earlier, Patty, the, to me, the rewarding thing is, after doing that in 2018, it really struck me that um, adolescents, teens who were at risk for mental health disease, it works even more with them. Because if you know the neuroscience, you know, they don't have a fully developed prefrontal cortex to manage their emotions. Mm -hmm. So working with uh, in a group here in Southern California where there were a few teen suicides and they wanted to really get the message home to these kids. And it's been we opened a wellness center in response mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been really powerful. So I think this idea of understanding your brain, no matter what level you're at, we've done it with eight-year-olds, we've done it with C-suite mm -hmm. um, individuals. It really resonates with people. People want to know about their brains. Yeah. What What do you feel like are some of the basics that you bring to people when you're kind of just trying to teach them some of the, um, you know, kind of quick facts about their brain that could be beneficial for them to know. What do you think are some of those basics that you really like to start with, especially for leaders? Yeah, I think the one that you can tailor towards any age group or educational level is this idea that our brain is wired through evolution to look for danger, to look for threat. Okay, so it's very good at, at detecting and reacting to threat and, and perceived danger. 
And therefore, we can understand a lot of our biases, a lot of the ways that we see the world. And we have the ability to manage that. We have this higher brain, as opposed to most other species, um, where we can manage those emotional reactions. If someone makes you angry, you mm -hmm. yell at them, you, you explode. If you see someone different than you, your, your default is to be suspicious. You know, they're part of my out group. I'm not sure about them yet. We have the ability as humans to manage that. Mm -hmm. And so the one message I love people to get, no matter what we're talking about, is we have a brain. We could build this resilience into it. We can strengthen that higher brain so that it can manage our emotions and manage our stress. And so we talk about how to be resilient. And I think that is something that everyone can use. And in today's society, I mean, imagine a society where we didn't have a negativity bias to things or people who were different from us. Just that alone, mm -hmm. understanding others' perspectives. Things would look a lot different in our world today. Yeah, yeah. Being able to to pause for a moment and yes. uh, and yes. check ourselves when we start to go down maybe that path that is well worn. Those connections that we've made that uh, yeah. that we've used over and over. Finding ways to slow down, I guess, would be one of the interventions. Yeah, and even when we talk, even I distinctly remember talking to eight-year-old kids about the fact that you can change the wiring of your brain. You could change mm -hmm. the way it is set up to react. And they were fascinated by that mm -hmm. because even at eight, they had learned in their science class, okay, once your brain forms, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's downhill from there once you are matured. And that's not the case. Neuroplasticity yeah. is a wonderful thing. Yeah. And understanding neuroplasticity in the um, context of interpersonal relationships and and how we interact with others. And that influences the connections, you know, in an organic substance of our brain. I, it, it is very interesting and I think can help people to, like you said before, I think maybe disconnect from some of the, you know, feelings that they might have where we beat ourselves up for the way we are um, or, or even if there's, you know, neurodivergence and, and maybe people are interacting in a way that is not what they see from everyone else. Then how do I, um, you know, how do I make sense of that? And then use what I know, um, take what, what I've learned about the brain and use it. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about, you know, some exciting things happening in your work. What are you focusing on right now? What's going on that is um, feeling like you want to tell others about it? I think what's exciting is as this whole field of psychological safety has emerged over, I mean, it's been around for quite a long time, but since Google published Project Aristotle a few mm -hmm. years ago, it's really exploded and getting people to really buy into the idea. You mentioned social interactions, collaboration, this idea that we have a good chunk of our brain dedicated to social interactions. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we really appreciated that in the field of neuroscience, even a few years ago. So getting them to understand this idea that if you can understand what drives your, your need for psychological safety, what is it? Self-awareness. So self-awareness about what makes you feel psychologically safe mm -hmm. and therefore what causes or can mitigate stress in your life. Once you do that, you can open up your brain to do those things that, that I talked about earlier, taking someone else's perspective, um, uh, being able to empathize with someone. Maybe, maybe if you don't agree with their political ideation, you can still appreciate their perspective. You can still get along with them. Mm -hmm. um, these are the things that I think are really, uh, to me, magical for the brain, because once you can do that, you can open up the possibilities of your brain to bring people to your in-group, to treat them as you would treat yourself, and to not only, I think what we're going for in the field now is to not just sort of tolerate diversity. You mentioned neurodiversity, mm -hmm. diversity of all type, but to embrace it, to understand that mm -hmm. diversity in all shapes and forms can be beneficial and it can help us in the workplace be more creative. It can help us mm -hmm. wire our brains to appreciate it more and more and to lean into diversity as opposed to just managing it, right? That's, yeah. I think that's what we want to see, embracing diversity for the sake of the benefit of it, not just saying, okay, I'll put up with it. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not checking the block of feeling like, mm -hmm. okay, well, we've got everyone at the table or we've, you know, but really being able to leverage the power of the strength of differences. Yeah. Um, 
That's great. So, I mean, I love hearing you talk about this because you're really passionate about it. And I can tell that, you know, that um, you you want to bring this to other people. So, you know, what um, what ways can people connect with you, learn more about what you're doing? Um, and if you did have, you know, like a, a dream referral or something you'd love people to throw your way, what would that be? Um, so, so the easy way to get a hold is brainleadership.com. That's the Academy of Brain Based Leadership uh, website. And we actually offer a free assessment online uh, from our, our validated assessment that we use, which quantifies, you know, which of the more uh, low hanging fruit domains for our brain are needed for psychological safety. So it sort of tells you what is your greatest or least greatest need from the brain's perspective to impart psychological safety on you and and then what you can do about it. Um, and, and so based on that, you know, we, we debrief people, we have coaches who, who work with them to understand this and importantly to not just get self-awareness, mm -hmm. but practical applications of how to manage that moving forward. Um, and, and so so that's a lot of what we do with the education um, and, and the accreditation. We actually, a lot of our work is accrediting coaches and consultants to be able to deliver this to their organization and their mm -hmm. clients to, to help them to get that neuroscience slant to it. Um, so, so that's what I would recommend. And in terms of dream referrals, yeah, you know, uh, myself and Lee Hall, who are the co-founder of the group with me, our dream is to really make this accessible to the world mm -hmm. and especially to the next generations, because mm -hmm. that's really where I think we make the biggest difference. So to me, it's about getting to schools, um, we're working in programs in health classes and biology classes to get the basics there, but really working with educators, teachers, so they understand their children better, their classes mm -hmm. better, and they can manage these classes better. And then from there, trickle it down to the kids so they can work with their friends and have better relationships. And, and like you say, not, not have this mental health stigma attached mm -hmm. to beating ourselves up all the time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really an issue with kids right now with teens. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We yeah, we definitely see that that's needed. Um, yeah. And I love that you're, you know, really passionate about bringing it out to uh, the folks who will be in our workplaces. You know, exactly. 10 years from now, we're, we, we need to prepare people for um, being able to manage, um, you know, themselves and interacting in the workplace and what when better to start than earlier. So. <laughs> And it's interesting. I mean, you may know this, but even working with a diverse group of employees, the baby boomers versus the millennials, there's a big difference in what their brains need to feel psychologically safe. And we're seeing it. And it was anecdotal. And now that we've done more, more than 10,000 people on our assessment, you start to see the results. And we have to we, we have to take that to heart. Um, it's not like it was 20, 30 years ago where you had the carrot and the stick. It really isn't. Well, you know, I think that you have just, you know, piqued a little bit of interest into that. If like from a high level, what would you say would be some of the differences that you see in the needs of the baby boomer generation versus maybe the millennial generation? I don't want to forget Gen Xers. I know they are the forgotten. Um, yeah. But what you know, there's some differences that you're starting to see um, validated that maybe mm -hmm. we kind of anecdotally would have guessed. But what are you seeing? Well, I, I think what we see is with the older, with the baby boomers, for instance, it was it was almost, and, and it seems to almost be a mindset of survival of the fittest. You do what you have to do. You keep your head down and you keep your nose to the grindstone and you're going to get the results, okay? And it's about the work. Don't talk about your feelings. I don't want to <laughs> hear about your emotions because that's, and, and the mindset is almost like we've got this brain of ours that we use at work and then outside of work. And it's a different brain and mm -hmm. it has different needs. And we know that's not the case now. Whereas with the newer generations coming into the workforce and the millennials, they know that. They're socially conscious. They want to have a, a legacy. They really want to do something the right way. And they really have a strong need for fairness. You know, you, you can't tell them that um, put your head down and do the work and forget about everyone else. It's about the results. They're more about how did we get there? Was it equitable? You know, are we are we honoring the diversity of the group? And I think it's definitely a more informed and um, open minded approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you have the baby boomers who may be in the C-suite and the millennials who are well beneath that, it, it's it's a tough clash. You know, mm -hmm. you, you've, mm -hmm. got, you, you've yeah. got a lot of issues there. 
Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed learning about some of the work that you're doing, and I'm interested to learn more. Um, and I'm sure you'll get some of our SCP members reaching out to you. So checking out your website. Um, I appreciate you being here with me today. Is there anything else you'd like to leave our SCP members with, um, you know, from uh, your experiences being connected to the um, division? Yeah, I would say uh, stay up. What I always tell people is be humble. You think you may know the way things work, particularly when we talk about neuroscience, and you may have your theory mm. that you teach or deliver to your clients. Um, keep up with the latest research. The great thing about the brain is this truly the last frontier in biology in our bodies, mm -hmm. uh, and it changes a lot. But the downside of it is we have to keep an open mind and say, hey, that's what we thought five years ago, but it's different now. Let's, yeah. So let's let's take it, and and it's exciting to some people and to others it's frustrating. Yeah. Be humble, keep an open mind, and stay up with the latest research. All right. Well, thank you for being with me, Dan. I hope you have a beautiful day, and to everyone else, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Betty. Bye.